honor, it's a pleasure, especially to share, share, share the stage here with uh, a few colleagues. Unfortunately, I don't have too much time, but uh, I'd like to pretty much echo a lot of what was already uh, said you know, before I got up here. Some things to discuss. We talk about management of space traffic, but in order to manage something, you have to know it, and you can't know it unless you measure it. So it really focuses on measuring things. We can come up with policies, we can come up with norms of behavior, uh, you know, Holger talked about uh, this issue of compliance and being able to, to basically monitor, if you will, uh, some of these behaviors. That's a critical piece. And it can't be a monitoring just by a single entity because then it becomes what we in the United States call he said, she said. Uh, it needs to be very transparent, very global, so that everybody is able to see this body of evidence and be able to come to a consensus on what these behaviors are and the impact of these behaviors. I'm not going to spend too much time on this except to say that the way that we, and when I say we, I'm not speaking, by the way, I don't work for the US government. I just want to like, put that out there. Um, I, I used to, but I don't anymore. Uh, and, if, and if I did, maybe I wouldn't be getting a paycheck. OK, I won't go there. Um, so, um, But this is to say that I like to compartmentalize the problems in space situational awareness and space traffic in terms of things that we know we know, things that we know we don't know, uh, things we have no idea that we actually know, and the worst of it are the things that we don't know that we don't know, okay? And so, um, ideally, we're working in the, in the realm of known knowns. Uh, this is ideal decision making. This is when we can manage and quantify risks and impacts. But not everything lives in that space. Uh, when we first detect an object, we know that we don't know may maybe the size, the shape, the material properties, and so we have to accommodate this somehow. And so, so we tend to be very conservative uh, in applying uncertainty and ambiguity to these known unknowns. One of the things that we'd love to be able to do is have a big data problem in space. Right now, we don't have a big data problem in space. So what do I mean by big data? Some people say, oh, Mariba, I have this telescope and I can give you terabytes of information every night. There is big data. And I say, no, that's a lot of data. That's not big data. So big data is a lot of data that's very disparate, disparate sources of information. OK, that's what we want. And we want to be able to apply things like AI, ML to these things to see what can we discover uh, about what's going on in space. All right. One of the things that Holger brought up is this idea of trackable objects. And he talked about this iceberg, and indeed it is, because we do not track most of the human-made uh, objects in space. And one of the things that uh, I tell people is that making something detectable isn't necessarily trackable. These things aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, tracking something means that you can both detect it and you can identify it. If you can't identify the thing, then there's no tracking it. Tracking means you can put a first name and last name to this given object. Tracking means you know that it was the thing that you saw last night or last week. That's what tracking gets to. Detection by itself is uh, necessary but insufficient uh, to get us to where we need to get to. Ideally, we'd like to be able to say, on the far left, we have all these things that we can measure with our sensors, but we want to move towards the right towards quantifying, towards a taxonomy, a classification scheme of objects so we can apply the proper regulation to these things. Uh, a satellite that's not maneuverable should probably not be treated the same thing as something that is maneuverable. Something that has low thrust propulsion probably shouldn't be treated the same as something that has high thrust propulsion. But unless we can come up with this sort of classification scheme and taxonomy, we're fooling ourselves in being able to say that we're going to pass laws and policies that are going to be meaningful to this idea of long-term sustainability of that space environment. So on the top row, close your left eye and read. No, I'm just joking. So I'm not looking for you to necessarily read this, except to say that one of the things that we're exploring are ontological frameworks, a way of semantically describing a domain to hopefully link all these disparate sources of information together to get to this idea of discoverability. And uh, if there's time, I might get to an example of where this is uh, powerful. 
One of the things that we've been doing that we put together is this framework called Astrograph, and it leverages big data science and analytics best practices. We have a three-tiered process. We have the, the lower tier are just sources of information. It could be the two-line elements from Stratcom. It could be the uh, JIC Vimple catalog from the Russians. It could be the Discos database that Holger talked about. But um, all of these things need to get mapped in a lingua franca, a common vernacular, a way for us to make use of it. We're really interested in exploiting curated data, not just blindly trying to apply things to, to, to different information sources, but properly curating data so that it's meaningful with the metadata, so that it's useful in, in, in explaining uh, the different phenomena that we can observe. And then the upper layer are applications that can um, basically interact with this graph database. Um, we looked at compliance, and this is just an example of an ontological framework that we put into, into place to look at compliance with uh, geo disposal. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't discuss this, but if people have questions, we can talk about it later on. Uh, you don't necessarily need a computer to do this, right? But the thing is, we want to be able to scale the ability for a machine to uh, come up with uh, the monitoring and assessment of behaviors for all the different, say, UN Copious guidelines, for all the IEDC guidelines, any sort of space laws that maybe Finland might put together. So how do you, how do you, how are you able to explain these things? And oh, by the way, the thing that most people don't talk about because everybody talks about the hard physics of sensors and detection and tracking, but there's a human element to this. Of all the uh, objects that Holger talked about, he said, okay, we, we only really care about the 7%. Well, guess who controls the 7%? People. And so if you don't have any understanding of humans, you can't understand the behavior, you can't predict that behavior, okay? Physics only explains so much. And um, so anyway, being able to, uh, you know, areas that we're now looking at in, in, in terms of trying to bring in this knowledge are things like computational behavioral sciences and computational social sciences. Um, Jean-Jacques, uh, you know, you brought up the way the US might look at things or Russia or China. This stuff matters. Not everybody looks at space the same way. And so if you wanna, here's the thing, if you want safety, security, and sustainability, you want predictability. If you have a given scenario and you can predict what everybody in this room is gonna do in that scenario, that's where you wanna be, that's ideal. But if there are people in the room where you say, I have no idea what they're gonna do in this situation, that's when people get nervous. That's when you have this idea of lack of security and lack of safety. So predictability is a key thing, and cultural competency must be an element in that predictability. So this is where I'd like to bring up. Uh... So this is something, this is an, an application that we put together, it's called Astrograph. If you, uh, right now, if you go, if you Google Astrograph on your cell phones or your laptops, you can get to this. And so this is, this is being assembled every day. So every day, we have multiple sources of information that we pull from across the globe, the Stratcom TLEs, the, the Russian JSC Vimple catalog, we have all of Planet Labs CubeSats, we have Leo Labs radar data, on Planet Lab, CubeSat, Spire, Iridium, Digital Globe. Um, we also have UCS database. We have access to Discos, which we plan on incorporating here. But in any case, this gives you a, a kind of a snapshot of different opinions, the combined set of the opinions of the sources of information about what <coughs> exists on orbit. You can see the, uh, the geo, uh, the, the, this geosynchronous region, everything in, in orange is operational. Everything that is not orange is something that is defunct or fragment or something like that, so you can see that. Interestingly enough, you can probably see that there is this, this string of pearls of like pink dots right there uh, in this uh, elliptical orbit, and let me zoom out just to kind of show that a little bit. Holder talked about breakup events. These things are not uh, desirable, and, and so uh, at the end of August, of, of 2018, just a few months ago, there was a breakup event in a geotransfer orbit of an uh, upper stage, and so the string of pearls that you see right here are all from the same object, okay? Single object broke up for reasons unknown, we can hypothesize, uh, and it created all those objects. 
So anytime something breaks up, folks, it adds uh, significantly to, to the population, and, and hopefully it adds to the trackable part of that population. Um, but in any case, that kind of shows you uh, uh, what that is. Now, when I say opinions, what do I mean by that? Okay, let me, let me show you what I mean by an opinion. Right, so, so what you see here um, basically is, is the opinion of a given satellite, it's the Flock 1C10 from Planet Labs, just as an example, one CubeSat. And number one, number one is where the, the, the two-line element set says that object is, okay? And then there's number two is the owner, which says it's right here. Oh wow, look, it's like a continent away. Uh, and then, there are also uh, some other sorts of information, Leo Labs tracking radar, uh, which I'll zoom in here a little bit so you can see, and then orbit determination that my own team does with uh, that Leo Lab uh, radar data. So again, you have number one, which is the two-line element set uh, uh, that's freely available, and then you have a cluster of things right here, and let me see if I can zoom in for you. Okay, so let's see. It's a bit uh, tricky trying to do this from here, so forgive me if my hands are not as versatile as they should be. All right, so I'm zooming in here. Let's see. The point is that I want to make is that not everybody who tracks satellites, who says this is where the satellite is, not all, not all of that is necessarily accurate or precise their opinions. So one of the things that I tell people is, how do you know that you have the world's most accurate clock? Anybody? Can anybody answer that question? How do you know? I asked this to a student, and he said, oh, I just assumed that mine's right. So yeah, that's probably not good. Any opinions about how, how do you know you have the world's most accurate clock? Watching time at the other side. <laughs> so that's one opinion. Uh, so let me tell you how time is currently uh, done around the globe. The way that you know that you have the world's most accurate clock is that you have about 350 of them. That's how you know. It's all about consistency. There are, there are over 300 clocks around the globe, atomic clocks, that give an opinion on the time, and these get compared amongst each other. They get weighted based on whether it's rubidium, cesium, hydrogen maser. They get weighted, and the very center of the time is what ends up being the global timing standard. So this is to say that if somebody says, oh, I can tell you where flock you know, 1C10 you know, is, many people can come up with an opinion, and only by looking at the consistency, the more data you have, the more opinions you have, the better shape you're in because you'll start seeing the right answer clusters around the same thing and the wrong answer may be uh, completely off uh, unless there's like some systematic you know, bias involved. But the point is this, I showed you, I showed you one, I, I'm showing you this actual satellite, right? And the opinion of these things, the owner says it's here. Uh, I and, and Leo Lab say it's just slightly off from that. Why? Because, well, you know, we don't, we don't know the physics perfectly. We don't have all the perfect assumptions of this stuff. So we can go with what the owner says in this case. But then, you know, if you zoom out, then you have the opinion of, like I said, you know, where the two-line element says it is, which is, you know, almost a continent away. And this is, this is something that's persistent for, for many objects. So it's not just somebody giving you data saying this is where something is. How accurate is that? How trustworthy is that? Um, and, and being able to reconcile those differences is important. So. so again, one of the things that we want to do is we want to make space transparent and predictable. Uh, we got some initial funding from the FAA to put AstroGraph together. None of this is proprietary in terms of the code itself. AstroGraph is cast in Neo4j. Neo4j is the most kind of open source uh, graph database available to the planet. All the, our orbits are computed with Oracle, which is also open source. Any orbit determination that we do, we, we, we've developed Python code. It's on GitHub. So 
So what we actually do to compute orbits, we've put out there as open source as well. Here's the thing, you know, we're as safe in space as the least knowledgeable, most malicious person. Okay, I'm not gonna solve global malice, because, uh, you know, maybe that's a tall order for me, but certainly in terms of giving knowledge, I'm gonna try to give as much knowledge as possible as it helps us with this idea of, uh, you know, safety, security, and sustainability. And again, we want curated data, not just not, just not any, you know, anything. One of the things that we can do right now, again, is, um, uh, so I told you some of the sources of information that flow into this, so, so let me skip that. But the power in graph databases is this ability to link disparate sources of information to come up with correlations, and hopefully from those correlations, come up with causal relationships. So I told you there was a crude, crude example that I was gonna give to you, so, so forgive me for this. So um, here we go, graph databases. So there's a group of people in the United States that looked at what in the US was called white page information. If you put Marie Baja and, 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 and address or phone number, you're gonna see what my address is, at least you know the last place that I lived, that sort of thing. And so these people collected names, you know, first name, last name, phone number, and address, and they populated an ontology with this, a graph database. The next thing that they did is they brought in Uber, taxi records, disparate source of information, and linked linked the taxi records to this graph database. Anywhere where they saw the same phone number, they matched these things up, okay? This was in an area in Manhattan in New York. The next question that the person asked was, how many people in this area of New York has a high likelihood of cheating on their partner? And all of a sudden they saw spikes. Oh, Marie Baja takes an Uber at 8 p.m. every Tuesday, goes from his house to this building, but that building is not the grocery store, it's not a gym. What is Mariba doing? He spends four hours there and then comes back. I don't know. Maybe Mariba has a grandmother that likes soup every Tuesday night between 8 p.m. And what I'm saying is that, you know, the interesting thing is that there's no satellite tracking Mariba Jaw's movements. It was just a matter of bringing two disparate sources of information, linking these in a framework that enables this idea of discovering. People aren't doing that for space, except that we can. And so we're on a path to try to demonstrate that. Um, for the, for, for, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over these because I wanna get to the actual workshop, but there are some unsolved challenges. Uh, you know, this idea of uncertainty. Holger brought up collision risk. Um, there are many ways to compute this probability of collision. Let me tell you this. Most people, when they represent uncertainty, represent uncertainty as if it were, a, you know, belonging to a random variable, okay? And one of the things that we're trying to do in our research is saying, if something is uncertain, there might be some uncertainty due to actual randomness, and there's uncertainty due to ignorance, not knowing. These things should not be used interchangeably, because if you assume that the ignorance can be represented as a probability, you can really make the wrong decision. And part of our research is going into this, but let me just kind of Skip over that uh, uh, for now. Um, one of the things that we want to do moving ahead, again, how to make things detectable, trackable, how to uniquely identify <coughs> projects in space, really trying to understand causality, uh, this idea of monitoring behavior in a holistic way to be able to apply sensible rules and norms of behavior and that sort of thing. and. Um, Holger uh, talked about how ESA is looking at this idea of capacity. One of the things that, that, that uh, I love that idea, um, somebody had brought up in the audience this idea of greenhouse gases, right? It's measured in tons of CO2 and impact to, 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 to greenhouse gases. You know, I would like to talk about, capacity is a good word, another way to look at it is a space traffic footprint, much like a carbon footprint, call it a space traffic footprint. And I would say that the space traffic footprint, much like the whole greenhouse gas thing, is the burden that any given object imposes on the rest of the community in terms of safety, uh, uh, security, and sustainability. So that burden on the community in those three areas is how I would measure this space traffic footprint. And just like Holger said, you can give back. You can minimize the footprint. It'll never be exactly zero. Because even an object that I know exactly exactly where it is, exactly where it will be. If I'm an operator, I still have to account for the fact that that thing exists 
and that is a burden on me. So there is no such thing as zero space traffic footprint, but you can try to minimize it or give back uh, as much as possible to the domain. I think that's fine. all join in, in, in saying that this is a very illustrative and inspirational uh, presentation as a, a space um, law researcher I'm, I'm very much interested that we have very similar questions uh, in mind. Uh, unfortunately because of the, of the time um, we will not have the possibility to have questions at, at, at this point but I'm most sure, certain that the, the people will come and, and talk to you during the, the coffee break so, so thank you very much. Thank you.